I'm on a mission to get every human being in the world to add one simple thing to their morning routine. And it is called the high five habit. And here's what it is. Every morning after you brush your teeth and you get that gunk out of your mouth so you're not spreading that nasty breath everywhere, okay? I want you to take a moment, put your toothbrush down and look at the human being in the mirror. That's not your reflection. That is a human being who needs you. A human being who's beaten down, who feels forgotten, who is so sick and tired of your criticism. And I want you to just stand there and look at them and take a moment because the rest of your day is going to be about everybody else. And then I don't want you to say a thing. This is the genius of this habit. You can be on your lowest morning, which I was when I, again, divine in intervention or stupidity. You can be the judge, right? It was April 2020, and I was uh, having a moment in my life where I just felt overwhelmed by life. I was waking up. The anxiety had come back. I felt like life was unfair. I had lost my dream job. Um, we were in the middle of the pandemic. My kids were in a state of huge grief and anger and frustration because university, you know, had closed and, you know, now they're dealing with it. Um, I had a bunch of speed, like all of a sudden my business is imploding. And, you know, don't forget just over 10 years ago, I was in a crisis financially where my husband and I were about to lose every, we couldn't even pay for groceries. My dad was lending us money. Yeah. And so it was triggering all of that. And I was thinking this, like, what the, I've worked so hard. I'm a good person. Like, I'm. how could you be doing this to me? Like, I don't deserve, like, just. And, and you you were pretty successful at that point oh already, right? God, successful? You know I was what? the number one motivational, female motivational speaker in the world. I had a daytime syndicated talk show yeah. in the United States, so 175 shows a year giving advice. I, um, you know, had the five second rule book, which was self-published and a huge millions of copies sold. Um, but I think that's the powerful thing about this story. Even with all that success, mm -hmm. you were still racked with self-doubt and anxiety and of negative course, thoughts. Because I hadn't had the biggest breakthrough of my entire life yet. And I had it yeah. one morning in April of 2020. You see, the five second rule is extraordinary, but it doesn't address what I believe is everybody's fundamental issue. And everybody's fundamental issue is that you either hate yourself or you do nothing but judge yourself. And this habit of relentless self-criticism and relentless self-rejection is the reason why you're unhappy. It's the reason why you're never satisfied. It's the reason why you can't take a compliment and why you're uncomfortable feeling celebrated. And it all comes down to the fact that when you stand in front of the mirror every single morning, you have this really subtle way that's not so subtle of starting your day by rejecting yourself. And I'm going to unpack this because it's unbelievably powerful when you start to truly understand this. Because if you can't look in the mirror and authentically see a human being that you respect, that you encourage, that you like, that you're cheering for, I'm going to even leave love off the table. Because I think that is so unattainable for where people are right now, let's just go with, can you accept yourself? Can you like yourself? Can you see a person that's worthy of support, worthy of your encouragement? Can we just start with that baseline? Because for my research, the average person cannot. From my research, 50% of men and women do not or cannot look at themselves in the mirror because they are either disgusted by the person they see or they are disappointed by them. And for those of us that can look in the mirror, we're still rejecting ourselves because we focus on what we don't like 
or we start to mindlessly think about all the things that we haven't done right or that we didn't do yet. You know, on this particular morning, April 2020, I'm overwhelmed by my life. I drag myself into the bathroom. I immediately see my reflection and I'm like, oh, God, you look like hell. I start ticking off all the things, the saggy neck, one boob lower than the other, like, you know, how exhausted I look, the gray hair coming in, how old I'm starting to seem. Yeah. And then the mind, once it goes negative, keeps going in that direction, unless you're five, four, three, two, one, not thinking about that. But so my mind's like going down the drain. I'm like, why'd I get up so late? I got a Zoom call in eight minutes. God, you didn't even, you know, text him back yet. And the dog still needs to be. And I'm like the beat down, the boom, boom, boom starts. And, you know, I don't know what came over me. But that morning standing there, yeah. could not think of his thing to say. And here's the important part. When you feel like shit, when you're overwhelmed by your life, you're not going to believe a pep talk anyway. Because it doesn't match how you feel. And so for whatever reason, I literally just raised my hand and I high-fived the woman that I saw in the mirror because she looked like she needed a high-five. She looked like she needed somebody to say, it's going to be okay. You can do this. Get out there. And, you know, from that very first one, you know, it wasn't like lightning came crashing through the ceiling and, you know, stuck me in the head. That's not what happened. But there's definitely a switch inside each and every one of us. Yeah. So, like, think about the walls here. Yeah. Even when the lights are off, there's electricity in these walls. Even during your worst moments, there is vitality ripping through your veins. There is an electrical life force within you. And life can turn that switch off, but it's still there. There was something about this high five action that felt like a flip, like the switch flipped on and all of a sudden the energy could connect back and something inside me turned on. Now, that first morning, I didn't go, yeah, like that's not what happened. I just felt this sort of shift from to, all right, you got a roof over your head, you know, your, your, your family's healthy, yeah. you've, you've saved money. It's not that bad. Yeah. Get out there. Like, I didn't even think those things. It was more like the electricity, the, the energy in me, this vitality kind of kicked in. But it was the second morning where the profound nature of what I was stepping into really kicked in. So I wake up, anxiety, ankles right up the legs, feel like the rush of, oh God, something's wrong. Five, four, three, two, one, I get out of bed. I start walking to the bathroom and it's, as I'm walking to the bathroom, I'm not even in there yet, that I feel something I have never felt in my entire adult life. And it's this. You know when you're about to go to a um, cafe and you're going to meet somebody you're really excited to meet, right? Yeah. Or, or somebody you really love, you know, you're going to see them. Yeah. What do you feel, right, as you're about to walk in the cafe? You're excited. You're, you're upbeat. You know, you're anticipating something good happening. Yeah. I actually realized I was feeling that way about seeing myself. Yeah. Now, I'm 53 this year. I don't think until that morning in April 2020, I had ever had an experience as an adult of being excited to see the human being Mel Robbins. I've been excited to see an outfit or a haircut or the way a new eyeshadow might look. But the human being, the way our kids, when they're really, really little, just love the sight of themselves, this unconditional support and celebration that's hardwired in your DNA when you're born. Yeah. And so as I rounded the corner that second morning, that's when the profound nature of this started to really hit me. And I stood there and I stared at the woman in the mirror and I realized I don't think I've ever asked myself the question, what does she need for me today? I've never joined in partnership with myself. I have been so busy trying to get shit done, trying to make sure people like me, trying to make sure the bills are paid, trying to make sure everybody else is okay, trying to do all this stuff that is the stuff of our lives that I have forgotten about the most important person, and that is myself. And again, I'm going to go back to a point that, that 
you know, we have been talking about kind of in various ways, which is we all know that we're supposed to love ourselves. We all know that we're supposed to be kind to ourselves. You can yeah. read a quote on Instagram. You should talk to yourself like your best friend. The problem is how? You know, you read a quote like that, you're like, no shit, Sherlock. How do I do it? I mean, like, what? Seriously? Right? How do you do that? I don't know. I've been beating the shit out of myself for years. How do I stop doing it? I don't know. And, you know, here's the thing. Like, logically, we know it's stupid because if beating yourself up, being hard on yourself, rejecting yourself, trashing yourself, if it actually worked, we'd all be millionaires. We'd have rock star bodies. We'd have the best marriages on the planet. We'd never have to work a day in our life. We'd be on a beach somewhere. Like, it would work. Yeah. But instead, we have these patterns of thinking and small patterns of behavior, like not looking in the mirror at yourself is a form of rejecting yourself. Picking yourself apart is a habit of rejecting yourself. And so when you start your day like that, which you do, and then you go out into the world having rejected your very being, this is the reason why you are so thirsty for everybody else's validation. This is the reason why you are seeking your worth in the money that you make, in the car that you drive, in the, the downloads that you get, in the likes that you have, in the neighborhood that you live in. You think your worth is outside of you. And I'm here to tell you the secret to your fucking life is grab that worth and bring it back home. Start practicing a physical habit, an action that demonstrates to your brain that you respect yourself, that you believe that you're worthy, that you deserve forgiveness, that you deserve encouragement, that you believe in you. And as you start to practice the physical action, the universal symbol for I got you, I love you, I celebrate you, I see you, I believe in you. When you practice this physical action, the neuro association that is already in your brain with the high five to yourself in the mirror takes over. It's insane how this works. The science is mind-blowing. I think this is a thousand times more powerful than the high five habit because it cuts down to the core of who you are. You think you think it's more powerful than the five, four, three, two, one habit? Hell yes, I yeah. do. Hell yes, because the five, four, three, two, one is a tool that will push you to take action. Five, four, three, two, one is a tool you use to cut off the worries that trigger anxiety. 54321 is a tool that you use to create a moment of objectivity and control when you're normally triggered so you can consciously choose a different response. Yeah. The high five habit goes all the way down to the core of who you are and how you treat yourself. And when you become a human being who has compassion for yourself, who likes you, it won't matter what happens out there. Yeah. Because everything in here is healed and taken care of. And so, like, you know, somebody can say to me, I don't love you anymore. I don't like you. It'll sting, but it doesn't change the fact that I still like myself. Because yeah. I practice and demonstrate it. That's the difference. Yeah, and, and that's, I think, the hidden magic in the high five habits is... Because I've been trying it the last few days, right? You... And what did you experience? It, it is powerful because. Well, walk us through like you're you standing to, at your bathroom sink yeah, and you, walk us through your experience. Well, first of all, you have to take a pause from your life, whatever you were going to do. It requires an intentional pause to go, no, I'm going to now do this action for myself. And I've got to say, before I tell you how it went, I think it would have been very different for me a few years ago because mm. I feel self-compassion, you know, not seeking your worth from outside, from other people, from download numbers, likes, what people say about you, which was a huge part of my life. Mm -hmm. I feel that having put a lot of that to bed now and really feeling that I actually like the person I see in the mirror these days. So I kind of feel five years ago, I would have had a different experience with it, but it was still powerful because you are just looking at yourself and you're, you're putting your hand on the mirror 
And I think what it is, it's just that pause, that moment of seeing me. Like you are seeing yourself. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, you know, obviously as a guy, what do we do? We often looking in the mirror. Um, we might be looking at our beard as we're shaving, <laughs> yeah. right? But you're not looking at your eyes, mm -hmm. right? You're just looking at, oh, I need to shave. Oh, I missed a bit here. Let me get rid of that. And then you crack on, right? Or you, you look at your face and your hair, but you're not really looking at yourself. Right. You're, you're, you're seeing your silhouette. You're, you're, you are seeing yourself, but you're not seeing yourself, if yes. that makes sense. Yeah. And that's what I think was really powerful was that it's just another, like, I feel it's just another tool now, which is going to take me all off two seconds, if that's five seconds tops. It's not as if I don't have time to add that in. There's no harm in adding it in. And frankly, I like adding it in. It makes me feel good. It's like, oh, and, and I think that's what you say. It's the action. Yeah. You don't have to say anything if you're not in the mood well, to say anything. I don't anything. want you to say anything, actually. And the reason why is the neuro association. So, um, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I mean by that. So, um, when you high five someone else, what does the action of a high five communicate? It's it's just a universal symbol of um, you got this. I see you. You're great. We can do this. You know, it depends on the situation, but it's it's a good feeling. It's a mutual sort of validation type mm -hmm, mm -hmm. experience. What did they? What tell me about the London Marathon and getting high fives? Oh, I mean, what did, what did a stranger's high five mean to you? It it just gave you like. And that's the key, it's strangers, right? You don't know them and they're looking at you and you're looking at them. Or you don't even, maybe you're not even looking at them. You just went through, you give a high five. It's it's like you've taken a shot of feel goods. Um, it's validation. It's like, hey, you know what? We're in this together. Um, you're standing at the side cheering. I'm running. But at that moment, it was like common humanity. It was like, there was no animosity. And actually, it's kind of one of my big learnings from the London Marathon actually was, and it relates to this, I think, is that that's kind of who we are. Like in in what is considered a very divided world at the moment, I went and did the London Marathon and all I saw was love, strangers giving love to other people mm -hmm. that they didn't know, right? And how did they give that love? Through cheering, but more often than not, with a high five. Correct. It is a universal symbol of encouragement, yeah. of love, of celebration. And the neuro association, whether you live in a culture where you've been high-fived or not, the neuro association is still there because you have seen them in sport. Yeah, You've seen them in marathons. You've seen teachers give them to kids. So your brain has a lifetime of programming in your subconscious that is triggered by this action. It is neurologically impossible to high five yourself and think you're a loser, you failed, I don't like your face. Your brain will not allow yeah. you to do it because the neuro association is so entrenched. It has only ever meant, I celebrate you, I see you, I got you, keep going, you got this, I'm behind you. It, you know, as you say that, Mel, it makes you think of gratitude, because when we are feeling grateful, we can't feel down, we can't feel anxious, we can't feel annoyed with ourselves. And in some ways, this is kind of gratitude for ourselves. Correct. Because the thing about gratitude, which obviously has tremendous, demonstrated, proven benefits in your life. Most of us are grateful for things outside of us. Yeah. What I'm teaching the world to do is to unlock neuro association in your mind and in your nervous system and aim it back at yourself and use this simple habit to interrupt the critic, to break the default loops in your mind associated with judgment, shame, criticism, hatred for self, and to replace it with a new default setting of seeing yourself the way you see your child, which is love. Yeah. Like my kids do stuff that piss me off all the time. 
And I can be upset with them or disappointed with them, but I never stop loving them. Yeah. And there is something that has happened to each and every one of us that is life's pains and heartaches and disappointments and setbacks sort of stack up. We stop loving ourselves. We start judging ourselves more. We start condemning ourselves more. We start rejecting ourselves more. We start trying to seek somebody else's love and approval in order to fill up this well inside of us that we've been digging because yeah. we've been rejecting ourselves. And so, you know, it's so powerful because the action alone is what communicates it. If you're looking at yourself and you raise your hand on your hardest days, what the high five says is not, yeah, I'm amazing. Like, this is not going to turn you into a narcissist. This is grounded in compassion. Yeah. This is basically saying, I see you. You're right. This is hard. And you know what? You can do this. And I'm going to be here. And I've got your back. And when you send yourself into your day with that physical action, it leaves an imprint in your mind and spirit. Now, there's a couple reasons why. I don't even write about this part in the book because I didn't know this until I started doing podcasts for the book. Yeah. So Dr. Amen um, told me, who's you know one of the leading experts in the brain, that one of the reasons why you feel better when you do it, no matter how terrible of a morning it is, is because your brain has always given you dopamine when somebody else high fives you. Yeah. So these sorts of gestures are rewarded in the brain. So when you simply high five yourself, your brain doesn't distinguish between me high fiving me and me high fiving you. It just sees, oh, I know what that is. Trip dopamine. Oh, yeah. I believe in that person. The second thing that happens is that your body is hardwired for celebratory energy. This is that electricity that's in the walls yeah. that has a switch that you can turn on and off. And so, you know, for example, if you, when you cross the finish line of the London Marathon, what do you instinctively do? High five someone. Yeah. And raise your hands, right? When your favorite team scores, raise yeah. your hands. When you yell surprise at a birthday party, you raise your hands. When you say hello, you raise your arm. When you go to high five somebody, you raise your arms. Yeah. When you hug somebody, you raise your arms. This is wired through your entire body. And normally we give that celebratory energy to other people or things. Yeah. I'm here to tell you when you high five yourself, you flip the switch. You flip the switch and give yourself a little bit of that vitality that's coursing through you to help you move into your day. Yeah, I see it as um, almost like it is about the high five, but it's not in many ways as well, because it's like if you're going down a road and the high five to yourself sets you off on a different path for the rest of that day compared to had you not done it, right? A thousand percent right. So let's just use a great example that everybody can, can latch on to. Sport. Yeah. So if a team is about to play the championship in the league, right? Yeah. And they're the underdogs. What is the best way to send the team into that game? Is it to be to beat them down? Oh, you did a terrible job on the London Marathon. You're going to face plant in New York. Oh, my God. And I saw your split times. We're fucked. No, that's not the best way to do it. But that's what we do to ourselves. Correct. Correct. And so I'm here to say you don't have to say anything because you're not going to believe it. So we're going to cheat this. We're going to circuit your feelings. You're bypassing Correct. words. It's like when you take like this ridiculous example, but it's like when you um, you take a B12 supplement, but you take it sublingually, so it dissolves. So you bypass having to go into the gut, through the liver, and then into, you get it straight in. Correct. And it's kind of, it's got that feel to me. Thousand percent. And so you send yourself into the game of life with that sort of optimism yeah. with that resilience, with that compassion. And, you know, look, some days you're going to laugh. Some days you might cry. Uh, people report some days you're going to just feel a little bit better. And some days you're going to high five yourself and laugh out loud from the <laughs> dopamine and walk into your boss's office and ask for that raise or quit. Because you're going to remember that no matter what, you're going to be okay. You're going to remember that no matter what, you got your own back. You're going to remember that it doesn't matter if nobody says great job at that presentation that you worked on because you can walk into the bathroom. As people have written to us, having practiced this, hey, I did a presentation at work. 
Nobody said a damn word. The old me would have walked into my cube and cried and thought I was getting fired. I knew I did a good job. I walked into the bathroom and high five myself. Your kids can stick this in their back pocket. And it's a way to reset yourself when you start going down that negative road. And why is this important? It's important because the high five is not going to remove poverty. It's not going to remove discrimination. It's not going to remove diabetes. It's not going to remove uh, the fact that somebody just said they want to divorce you. It's not going to remove all of the trauma. It doesn't change those things. It changes you. Yeah. And it changes your relationship with yourself and your ability to believe that through your actions and your attitude, you can move the needle on those things. Yeah. I, I, I love that last point, Mel, because the similarities between the way you talk about this and the way I've been talking about certain behaviors and five minute habits for years, mm. they are so connected. And one of the things I often say, and I want to just acknowledge you for what you just said, it's it's not going to change your life situation. You know, if you're if you're in poverty, you're still going to be in poverty, but you're going to be a different person. You're going to be better able to face the stresses that are in your life. Yes. And, and I think this is such an important point, right? Because I have said this before on the show, but but I, but I, I always think it's worth reiterating that a lot of people feel that self help or wellness is the preserve of the wealthy and the middle classes. But actually habits like this, yes, they'll help someone who's got a ton of money in their bank accounts, because a lot of people like that are are racked with self-doubt on the inside as well. But it's also going to help someone who is in poverty or a single mom who's working two jobs and has got three kids and is really struggling. That little micro moment each morning where she sees herself in the mirror. She signals to her brain that she is worthy, that actually she's a human being with real feelings. And for all her qualities and all her, you know, all the great things that she's doing, that has power, right? Oh my and God, it is amazing free. Power. It is free. There's free. not a single person, <laughs> pretty much, who is listening to this or watching this right now who couldn't just either pause or at the end go, all right. Let me, uh, I'm, I'm convinced, Mel. Like, oh, I'm going to give this a go. I'm yeah. going to give this a go. Yeah. Well, first of all, don't rush it. Don't rush it. So don't go into the bathroom and slap the mirror and be like, I didn't feel anything. Um, I want you to, again, as you so rightly put, take a minute and just look at yourself. Because for most people, that's the hardest part. I mentioned that, you know, I get smarter And I learned so much from every comment and people that write their stories in. And one person, uh, Allison Bird, a friend of mine, who made my ability to explain the depth of this so much deeper because she said one thing to me when she tried it before the book came out. She said, you know, I think it's working. I kind of feel, I feel energized. I said, but you know what surprised me, Mel? I said, what? She goes, the resistance. I said, the resistance? What are you talking about? She's like, oh, the first couple days I did this, I stood in front of that mirror and I, there was something in me that's like, I didn't, I couldn't even raise my hand. There was this resistance. And so I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And so I, of course, put something out, hey, to the 700,000 people on the newsletter list, anybody trying this and feel any resistance? We write to everybody that's in our little test group. Anybody feel, holy cow. There, it turns out that most people do not have an immediate positive, oh, I'm doing this yeah. reaction. Most people have massive resistance to even trying it. And I want to explain why, because this is extraordinarily sad. And it also is an enormous opportunity for growth. Because I believe, based on having 136,000 people go through a five-day challenge online that we're monitoring in an app from 91 countries and seeing what they're reporting, I know that this takes five days to work, five days before you have an enormous breakthrough in how you see and relate to yourself, five days before the chemical, physiological, neurological, physical, and psychological change starts to go 
holy cow, this is crazy. This works like this. And so the resistance comes from self-judgment yeah. and self-condemnation. And I'm going to tell you a story to drive this home. For people who stand in the bathroom mirror when they try the high five habit and they feel this resistance in their body. First of all, let me say, it's really normal to think this is weird because it is, okay? It, it just sounds so cheesy. I, for those of us that grew up with Saturday Night Live, you're going to think of Stuart Smiley. You know, I'm nice. People like me. That skit they used to do about the guy who talked to himself in the mirror. You're going to stand there and go, seriously, Dr. Charlie and Mel Robbins, you two have lost your mind. But okay. If it's weird as you do it, that's a sign it's working. Yeah. So Dr. Leaf told me, oh, well, that's what it feels like when a new neural pathway is getting plowed. So if it feels weird, good, because we're teaching you to do the opposite of criticizing yourself. Yeah. But the resistance is something else. The resistance is the fact that every morning as you start your day, you drag your entire past into the bathroom with you. And if you're somebody who has experienced trauma or been abused or abandoned or neglected or grew up with chaos and addiction, or you've been the victim of a crime, or you're constantly having to deal with discrimination or violence, all stuff that you're not responsible for. There are a lot of people who take all of that from their past, and when they look at themselves, they see somebody who's damaged. They see somebody who's unworthy. They see somebody who is unlovable because of those things. And what the high five starts to become when you do it is it becomes literally an act of defiance. It becomes an act of strength. It becomes a sign that I'm a survivor. It becomes permission to heal. It becomes this deep sense of feeling and knowing where you are and the fact that you have an extraordinary future despite all of the pain and suffering that you have endured and survived. And then there are people that bring everything they regret, all the shame, all the regret, all the, so the cheating, the lying, the stealing, yeah. the hurt you've caused yourself or other people, the missed opportunities. And boy, did I get an unbelievable example of this in my own life. So, you know, I was doing the high five habit myself. And during the early days of the pandemic, my husband had just been diagnosed with depression. And he's a super healthy guy. He is a certified Buddhist meditation instructor. Wow. He leads men's retreats called Soul Degree. He's a yoga instructor. He's wildly involved with our community yeah. and with our family. He's a super high functioning guy. But it's just, he's just felt heavy. He's, there's been like a cloud there, like a heaviness to him, like no, there's no light between his eyes. And yeah. so thankfully, you know, his therapist uh, finally got him to go see a psychopharmacologist and somebody to do the advanced testing. They're like, dude, you have dysthymia. You have like really long-term depression. Like you're lucky you've been doing all this stuff because it's kept you alive. And you know, I turned to him at one point, I've been doing this for a couple of days or a couple of weeks rather. And I'm like, you know, I know I'm not your doctor and I know I'm not an expert in your mental health, but I really think you should try this high five thing. I really think it's going to help you with this depression. He's like, I'm not high five. It is the stupidest thing. I don't care what you're doing. No. And I'm like, okay, if you won't do it for yourself, would you just do it for me? Would you do it for five days? Cause we're in the middle of researching this now. And I like, I, I haven't even shared it with my audience yet. And I'm kind of like writing down in my journal what I'm feeling. And I've got a couple people on the team. Would you just do it for me? He's like, all right. So he kind of did the first one, like, are you happy? You know, typical <laughs> spouse thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know. So he did it for five days. And then I asked him what he thought. And he said, you're on to something really big. And I said, why do you say that? And um, I had no idea how dark my husband's thoughts were. I had no idea how much he was condemning himself, how much shame he felt. Um... I knew that he was struggling with depression. I had no idea 
that for the past seven years, the man who has stood next to me at the bathroom sink next to me would look up at the mirror and see a person that he hated. He saw a person that had failed. He believed that since the restaurant business didn't work and since it left us 800 grand in debt and that his wife had to go out and make the money, that he was the world's worst father, the world's worst husband, and he has been condemning himself every day for seven years. And the reason he thought the high five was stupid is because you only high five people you care about, you only high five people who are winning, and he of all people didn't deserve it. And for me, you know, I knew that he was struggling with shame around the restaurant business. I knew he was struggling with the amount of debt that we had and the fact that, you know, he had, you know, the investors lost money. Like for me, I had a totally different experience. I'm like, you guys worked at that for eight years? You made your investors whole? Like, you know, like, Hello, entrepreneurship. Like, you know, we wouldn't have the five second rule without it. Are you kidding? Like, woohoo, we're winning. This is amazing. Like, I didn't, his business partner had the same, like, he was proud of what they built, proud of how hard they worked. Chris, for whatever reason, that was not his story. Yeah. His story was condemnation, regret, shame. He could only see a failure. And, you know, what was, wild about that is, you know, I've for years talked Chris up. I've for years have told him how proud I am of him. I, you know, he's, he was the CFO of the business as my company, as the company was taking off. Yeah. Like he owns half of it. Like he's an integral part of everything. Yeah. He doesn't see it that way. And that's an important part. Yeah. Nobody can heal you. Nobody can change how you talk to yourself. This is an inside job. And so if you relate to how my husband feels, I want you to understand that what Chris said to me was that this high five and pushing through the resistance is an act of forgiveness. It's an act of healing. It's an act of support and compassion that allows you and shows you that you are giving yourself permission to feel good again, that you deserve to be happy, that you deserve and that you can continue to push on and go do better and be better and feel better. And that of all people, you're going to stop judging you. Okay, so I find myself uh, last year at a very low moment. I am standing in my bathroom. It's a moment I know every woman can relate to. They're in my underwear. Uh, I'm looking in the mirror. And of course, I am picking myself apart. I'm like, I hate how I'm getting really jowly right here. And I don't like how I've got these like big lines that are starting. And then I notice, you know, I've got this like indent right here that I don't like. And I don't like these like Marks right here that go this way on my neck. I've yeah, I mean, covered them up with foundation. Realize, yeah. like, I'm and like, then what this you realize. And then this boob hangs <laughs> lower than the other boob. And, and I'm just picking myself apart because that's what I've been doing for the past four decades. That's what almost all women and even men do it too. This is what I'm finding based on the research of the book. And then as soon as my mind is negative about my appearance, my mind goes negative about my day. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, I, I forgot to text Lisa back. I uh, need to finish up that report. Oh my gosh, my first Zoom meetings and I, oh, the dog needs to be walked. And now I'm going down the road negative about the day. The whole vibe is, ugh. Mm. And I don't know what came over me, but I just literally had nothing to say to myself. I really felt overwhelmed, just an average low moment. And I found myself, as pathetic as it sounds, raising my hand and high-fiving my own reflection in the mirror, braless in my underwear. It felt good. I put my shoulders back. I felt a little bit like, okay, I got this. And I went on with my day. The next day, there I am again. And my mind is going negative. And I'm like, nope, high-five. 
And that's what the high five habit is. But this is just the beginning. The, the high five habit book is full of a bazillion tools, but I want to unpack this one mm. because there's so much science here. And for women in particular, this is unbelievable in how it changes you and your relationship with yourself. So first, let's start with a high five. When, like, think about when in your life you have either given or received high fives. What does a high five from someone else or a high five that you're giving to somebody else communicate? Um, you're on the same team. You're like yep. in it together. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's also like I think about it. You like give it to somebody before a big play. We got this. You give it to somebody when their attitude's going down. Come on, keep going. Pick your attitude up. You give it to somebody in celebration. And so a high five communicates support and empowerment and partnership and trust and celebration. And it's so powerful and we're so good at giving all of those things to other people. Like you and everybody, especially women, we cheer for our friends, we create birthday parties, we buy people presents, we do work for our colleagues when they're overwhelmed, we help our parents out with whatever. We're so good at cheering for our favorite musicians and buying people stuff. Mm -hmm. We are horrendous at giving that same support and celebration to ourselves. In fact, we not only don't give ourselves support and celebration, we do the opposite. We tear ourselves down, and we beat ourselves up and we pick ourselves apart. And every single woman I know is constantly saying, how the fuck do I put myself first? How do I do? How do I love myself? I know I'm supposed to. Well, I'll tell you how you do it. You put yourself first by doing for yourself what you've been doing for everybody else, because that's how everybody else became first in your life. You need to start to cheer for, support, and validate yourself, period. I realize now that I'm high-fiving myself that I have spent the first 40 years of my life either criticizing my reflection or ignoring it. How sad is that? It's incredibly heartbreaking and yet ex extremely familiar to me. Yeah. And I think a lot of women. Yeah. And believe it or not, a lot of men. Mm. There's a lot of men that don't want to look themselves in the eye in a mirror and be with themselves because they're so focused on the things that they haven't achieved or the things that they failed at. And so they're ignoring themselves. Mm. They're not being with themselves. Mm. And so first things first, when you take a moment in the morning to just stand in front of the mirror and be with yourself, and then you raise your hand in a gesture that you have always associated with celebration, support, belief, and empowerment with other people. There's a number of things that happen that um, can be proven by research. First things first, uh, this is research out of Harvard. It's recent. Uh, they've shown in studies that simply taking a minute in the morning to get intentional about who you're going to be today mm -hmm. and how you're going to show up changes your productivity, it changes your level of confidence. It changes how impactful you are as a leader at work and in life. So this moment in the mirror is not to be diminished. This is a moment for you to be able to take a moment and intentionally align yourself with who you're going to be. Second piece of research is from a field of study called neurobics. It basically means when you marry a physical action with something, a thought that's unexpected, you accelerate the development of new neural pathways. Mm. And there's famous studies that have proven that if you brush with like your non-dominant hand while you're thinking something, yeah. it sticks in your mind because you have to focus. Well, the same is true when you raise your hand and high five your own reflection. You see, you've been doing this for your entire lifetime. So there's already subconscious programming here, Lisa. The second that you raise your hand like this, it is so programmed in your mind to associate belief, cheering, empowerment, celebration, you know, with the high five itself, that it's impossible to go, God, I hate my neck. Mm. Boy, is that cellulite ugly. You can't do it because this part of the mind immediately takes over and does all the positive stuff with a high five. It's crazy. Try it tomorrow morning. You will not be able to criticize yourself. 
Now there's another piece of research around this, which is, you know, when you do a high five, we did one the first one we did, right? right? We didn't quite hit each other in the right, like, good smack. So what did we do? We did it. Correct. Because a good high five requires you to be present and intentional. Isn't that cool? Yeah. All of that and a little high five. Mm. And so what I started to notice was that I was in real time shifting my relationship to myself. Instead of criticizing the woman I saw in the mirror or ignoring her, I was developing a partnership, a trust, a sense of self-validation, a I have my own back. I see you, Mel Robbins. We're going to have a great day today. We got this. No matter what it is that life is going to throw at us, you got this. That's how it all started. And then, of course, I put it on my story after a couple of weeks of doing it. And people around the world started to post them pictures of themselves doing it. And then all of their stories started rolling in about the difference that it was making. There was one woman that said that, She's been struggling with dysmor body dysmorphia for 20 years. Cannot look in the mirror. And after five days of doing this, can stare at herself in the eyes with a grin. Five days. Five days. And the reason why is because of the lifetime association mm. that you have with doing this for other people. So when you try this tomorrow, here's what I want um, you to do. Stand in front of your bathroom mirror and take a moment and just be with yourself for a second. And then if there's resistance to raising your hand and high-fiving your own reflection, what is that resistance? Then, so here's what you're going to feel yeah. when you do it. It's very simple. You're going to look at yourself in the mirror and you're going to leverage some research out of Harvard. We'll talk about that too. Yeah, okay. I want to dive into that. So you're basically just going to look at yourself in the mirror and you're going to ask yourself, what does that human being need for me today? How can I show up for him or her or they? How do I do that today? Kindness, do I need to be more courageous or bold? You kind of set this intention mm. for yourself. And then you're simply gonna raise your hand and you're gonna high five yourself. Now, a couple things I want you to expect. Number one, it will feel weird, period. It feels weird for everybody because it is the opposite of what you're doing right now. And so your brain is going to reject it as odd. Number two, you're either going to have one of two reactions. That's it. There's no middle ground. You will either have a very profound positive experience where you're going to laugh, probably because it kind of feels good and it's kind of silly, or you're going to burst into tears in a positive way because it's a release that you have finally woken up and started supporting yourself. You just got it. And that's where the tears come from. But more likely, although maybe not for you because you're a fan of this podcast, but more likely you will feel resistance. And the resistance is the dust mm -hmm. on the mirror. Mm -hmm. Every single morning, Jay, we bring with us our entire past. Whatever's been done to you, whether it's trauma or discrimination or abuse or neglect or abandonment, it is standing between you and the mirror. It's the dust. And you see that dust and you say, that means that I am not worthy. I am not lovable. So you see a human being that's distorted and you say to yourself, because of what's happened, I don't deserve a high five. Or if you're a human being, you've done a ton of stuff that you regret. And so all the things that wish you could change that you would forgive Jay or you'd forgive Mel Robbins for, you cannot forgive yourself. It's more dust. And so you stand there and you say, because of all that stuff that I did, I'm unworthy or I'm unlovable or I'm this or I'm that. And that dust keeps you from seeing a human being who deserves support and celebration. Or another form of the dust, which is the resistance, is that you actually believe that you do not deserve to be celebrated or supported unless you have the bank account or the number on the scale or you drive in the car or live in the neighborhood or your hair is less kinky or you're this or you're that. And so you withhold the very support and celebration that you need in order to change your life from you because you haven't done it yet. Mm. That's where the resistance comes from. Mm -hmm. And so I'm here to say, you got to try this for five days because it's going to feel weird. You're going to resist it. And what's going to happen is you'll notice as you raise your hand, and this is where the science gets amazing. As you raise your hand, Jay, you will go from thinking this is weird or thinking this is stupid to silence. And this is explained by science. 
there is a field of study called neurobics. Neurobics is a word that I did not invent. invent. It is aerobic or physical movement with new neural pathway development. And research has shown that when you use neurobics, it is the fastest way to form new neural pathways. So the way that you do it is you take an unexpected physical movement, like high-fiving yourself, something you've never done, and you marry it with a thought. Now here's where things get crazy cool. You've been high-fiving people your whole life. You've been receiving high-fives your whole life. So Jay, when you high-five somebody, what are you communicating through the gesture? Uh, a feeling of connectedness, a feeling of support, a feeling of I'm congratulating you or celebrating you, a feeling of you've got this, like that kind of feeling. Yeah, completely. All of it is programmed in your subconscious brain. Mm -hmm. When you go to raise your hand to high five somebody, I can never high five Jay and go, you're a jerk. <laughs> Jay, I don't like you. Jay, I hope your tea, which I'm a founding <laughs> club member of, really fails. You can't do it. Yeah. Because the programming is already in your brain. Yes. So you cannot look at yourself in the mirror and think terrible things while you're high-fiving yourself because your brain won't allow it. Right. It is programmed to think something different. And as you repeat this every day, just five days, dear God, give me five days of doing this, you will override the critic and you will reprogram your mind to associate belief, love, encouragement, support, resilience with your own reflection. Mm. This is why I don't even see myself in terms of a body anymore. I see a human being that I love, that I support, just like I would a friend or a child that I love unconditionally. It's mind-blowing, but that's not all. So I talked to our pal, Dr. Daniel Amen, and this isn't even in the book. This is just something I learned two weeks ago. He went bananas when I talked about this thing. So Jay, when you high-five somebody else, your brain drips dopamine. Mm -hmm. The reason why when you do this, even on a low morning, you get a boost in your mood and a little bit of clarity wow. is you get a drip of dopamine by high-fiving yourself. Wow. Again, because the programming is already in your brain. You're just now turning it from everybody else and giving it to yourself. Yeah. And there's a second thing that's super cool. So Dr. Amen was explaining, he said, you know, and you know, Mel, when you leave the bathroom, you feel kind of peppy, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of weird. He said, well, let me tell you what that is. He said, your nervous system is encoded with celebratory energy. When you wave hello, you're raising your arms. When you cross a finish line, you raise your arms. When you hug somebody, you raise your arms. When you high five somebody, you raise your arms. When you do this every morning, especially when you're going through a challenging moment, your nervous system recognizes the celebratory gesture and gives you a jolt of energy. Mm -hmm. Is that not incredible? This is a really profound moment in my life and a major turning point. And, you know, it's not a pandemic moment, but in order to kind of give you the backdrop of what was going on in my life, and given that at the time that you and I are talking, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I, I'll just tell you what was going on in my life, at least to the extent I can, based on what the lawyers tell me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, um, I had been, uh, everybody knows the moment that their life turned upside down because of COVID, whether you got news that the office was closing or you couldn't go see your, you know, grandmom or dad, or you, uh, you know, were quarantined with your kids and they were in a state of distress, there was that moment. And for me, what happened is I was taping a daytime talk show here in the United States and they found COVID at the CBS broadcast center in New York. And they walked into the taping room and said, uh, you need to evacuate the building. And within five minutes notice, Fern, uh, my show was canceled. I was fired from what had always been a dream job of mine. I grew up, you know, coming home from school. My mom would have Oprah Winfrey or Donahue on here in the United States. And I always wanted to do that and to help people doing it. And so five minutes, grab everything you can that's not nailed down, run out the door. Don't even say goodbye to the 130 people I'd worked with for a year. I get in the car. I start driving to Boston. I see the New York City skyline disappearing uh, in the rearview mirror. And, you know, Boston, Massachusetts is where my husband and I live. And then the phone calls start coming in. 
My daughter's in college in California. They're closing school. I, I, what's happening? What's happening? My other daughter's in Spain. You know, I, I can't get a flight. I can't. And the whole world starts to close down and we all felt it. So I get home and those first three weeks were basically a blur of alcohol and living in my pajamas and watching uh, Harry Potter, no kidding, on repeat with the kids. There were aspects of it were, that were fun. But what happened in those three weeks is I lost my dream job. My book publisher canceled my book and then told me I had to return the, 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 the money they had given us, money I'd already spent. Every speech I had for a year started to cancel and I started to get flashbacks to a moment in my life when my husband and I were nearly a million dollars in debt. This was 13 years ago. This is sort of my origin story. We were about to lose everything. And that's when I invented this thing called the five second rule. But I started having these flashbacks. We are fucked. Like this is happening again. Are you kidding me? I'm 52 years old. I've got to reinvent my freaking life again. And one morning I wake up and I use the five second rule. You count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. And I get out of bed and the anxiety is thumping through me and I make my bed. And I drag myself to the bathroom and I'm standing there brushing my teeth in my underwear. And I catch a glimpse of my reflection in the mirror. And I think, oh my God, you look like hell. And I had these dark circles under my eyes and my gray hair was coming in and I looked haggard and tired. You know, I, I actually felt sorry for the woman I saw reflected back in the mirror because I could tell she had the weight of the world on her shoulders. She was worried about her kids who were grieving and anxious and distressed. She was worried about herself, her employees. She was worried about the world and the frontline workers and her parents and her business and everything. And as soon as your thoughts go negative, it's like lint catching in a dryer, more and more and more negativity builds. And so then I started thinking about the day. And who doesn't start their day by going, I'm late. I forgot to do the text. I, today is going to suck. And then I look at my feet and there's my dog and he still needs to be walked. And I need to be on a Zoom call in eight minutes. And I just look like bloody hell. And, I, and I'm starting to feel heavier and heavier. And you know, what's interesting, Fern, is if you had walked into the bathroom in that moment, I would have been able to spin on a dime and be like, come on, Fern, you got this. You're awesome. I know this sucks, but come on, let's just take it one step at a time. You can face this. But standing there with myself alone in my underwear, one boob hanging lower than the other, like I, I, I couldn't think of anything to say because I didn't feel confident. I didn't feel optimistic. I didn't feel like I could handle what was happening. And as cheesy as it sounds, standing there without a bra on, I found myself just raising my hand and high-fiving the woman I saw in the mirror. Now, here's what's interesting. Almost immediately, I felt my shoulders drop. I chuckled because it's so stupid and cheesy to high-five yourself in the mirror. And it didn't disappear the problems. It didn't change all the stuff I was dealing with, but something inside of me changed. I felt this sense of, okay, I know this sucks. Pick your chin up, Mel. You got this, come on. And I sent myself into the day. Now it was the second day that something really interesting happened because what happened on the second day is when I woke up, I immediately thought about that high five. I five, four, three, two, one, got out of bed. I made my bed. And as I was walking toward the bathroom, I felt something I'd never felt in my entire life. And I'm going to explain it this way. You know, when you're about to go see a friend, you're going to grab a, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something, and you're about to walk into that cafe and you feel this sense of excitement that you're going to see somebody you like. And, you know, I felt that as I was sitting, you know, kind of waiting for us to connect. I was so wow. excited to talk to you. As I walked into that bathroom, I felt this sense that I was about to see somebody that I like. Now, I'm going to be 53 years old this year. I think for the first 45 years of my life, I have either criticized the woman I've seen in the mirror or I have ignored her. 
I have looked forward to seeing outfits that I'm wearing or makeup that I've put on. I have never looked forward to seeing myself. No, I, I haven't. I mean, it's, there's an awkwardness. There's a real awkwardness about, because when I was reading this section of your book, I was like, why have I never seen myself in the mirror? I've looked at myself. I've gone, oh, there's, that's what I don't like about it. And there's that. And I can improve that with some eyeliner, whatever. But I've never seen myself. And it, the beauty of that moment you've just described is seeing yourself was a moment where you hijacked the usual judgment that is just so omnipresent. We don't even think about it. It's just there all the time. When any of us look in the mirror, we go straight to the points we don't like. But you bypass that to empathy. And that is so rare that we look at ourselves with compassion and that we go, because, you know, the high five habit isn't going like, yeah, you're amazing. You rock. It's I see you. This is really hard. I get that it's really hard and it, it's OK. It's OK to find it hard. Yes. But yes. we don't look at ourselves in the mirror like that. Like I tried after reading the book and I was like, this is so fucking weird. I'm looking at myself. It's really awkward. There's, what is that awkwardness? Oh, okay. This is so sad. Okay. This is really sad. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to tell everybody right now, you have to do this five mornings in a row because you will feel resistance and you'll feel exactly what Fern's talking about. You'll feel this awkwardness and this weirdness and this tremendous sense of discomfort. And I want to unpack this on multiple levels because what that resistance represents is so profoundly sad. And this is what the enormous opportunity is when you start to practice habits of encouragement, of empowerment, of self-love and self-celebration. So first things first, none of us have ever been taught how to truly see ourselves, support ourselves, love ourselves and be kind to ourselves. We have not. We have, we have encouraged our children to do that. We do it for them. But at some point you stop listening to your parents and you start criticizing yourself. And so first things first, it's weird and awkward because you've never been taught how to do this. So it's not a habit. Your habit is the exact opposite. And as we know, whether you are trying to create a new habit of eating healthy or not drinking so much or knocking off the caffeine or getting out of bed early, you resist it and it feels weird because it's new. So that's reason number one, but that's not the sad reason. That's the scientific reason. The real reason why you cannot stand in front of the mirror and be with yourself where you are, how you're feeling in this exact moment of your life is because you drag your entire past to that moment. Everything that you regret, everything that you're disappointed about, everything that you have survived, the abuse, the trauma, the confusion, the heartbreak, all of your hopes and dreams that have not been realized yet. Yeah. They are with you in that moment. You do not see a person who is trying. You do not see a person who is worthy of celebration because of what you have survived in your life. You see somebody who is damaged because of that. You see somebody who is a failure because you're not where you're supposed to be. You see all of the things that you're not instead of all of the things that you are. And so that resistance and that weirdness and that judgment is actually rejection. It is judgment. It is disappointment. And here's the next layer of this. And this is why this habit, while cheesy on its face, I think is the most powerful thing that you could possibly do in your life in terms of adopting a new behavior. We have made the mistake as human beings of believing that you are only worthy of celebration and support when you achieve something that is worthy of celebration and support. So here you are standing with yourself every morning in judgment. The, the, the scale you know, doesn't have the number on it that it needs to be. My bank account isn't where it needs to be. My relationship isn't where it needs to be. My you know, career isn't where it needs to be. My mental health isn't where it needs to be. And you stand there and judge that. And then you go, 
cross your arms and go, well, I'm not going to cheer for that person until they get there. <laughs> yeah. so I'm going to just stand there and judge you. Yeah. So get out there, you, you loser, and see yeah. if you can lose that weight. Like it's literally insane. If you watch the marathon in London and those racers are running by, even Brits aren't standing there with their arms crossed going, bloody hell, you suck. I'm not yeah, yeah, clapping yeah. for your ass until you cross the finish line. No, you <laughs> like clap and you cheer people every step of the way. Your life is a marathon and you have outsourced the single most motivational and important thing that you need to other people. You're waiting for your spouse or your kids or your parents or your colleagues or your friends or your, your, your boss to cheer for you and to validate you. I'm sitting here telling you, you have to learn how to validate yourself yeah. and cheer for yourself where you are right now, or you're not going to get where you're meant to go. No, because, you know, that's, that's what we've been, um, I guess, more recently taught with social media or certainly encouraged that unless there's outside validation, you do not exist, which is a terrifying thought. Because if you are solely relying on our exterior validation, then when it eventually dissipates or there's a break in it, you're free falling. What are you going to do? So, so that is a, a huge problem. But going back one layer looking at all the judgment and all the past that we lug around, because I recognize that in myself, I'll look in the mirror and I'll conflate my own thoughts about myself with other words spoken from people I've met along the way or strangers, whatever it might be. And I am, you know, pulling that along in a massive sledge behind me, like every morning. How do we, because everyone's got that. And I'm Everybody. thinking people at home are going to be like, yeah, yeah, I, I have that. But how are we moving past that? How are we not bringing our whole past and our lump of regret with us each morning? How do we move on? Because, you know, I know, obviously, sometimes with tricky situations in life, you might have had good intent, but others have still judged you or you've ended up in a tricky spot. But there will still be times in our past where we acted without good intent. And we know that we, we did something out of jealousy or cruelty or whatever it might be of just feeling angry about our own lives. So how do we let that go when we know that good intent wasn't anywhere near that situation? How the hell are we stepping over that massive pile of crap? Well, you know, I think that, look, I think especially your listeners know that you act out in pain because you didn't know any other way to cope. And so when you can bring empathy and understanding to what happened to you, you can start to understand the behavior. And it's only when you understand the behavior from the past that you can spot it and you can catch it and you can change it because patterns of behavior repeat unless you break them and replace them. And so one of the reasons why this high five habit, and it's just one of a bazillion habits in this book that we can talk about to address this question. One of the th reasons why high fiving your reflection in the mirror works is because you don't have to think anything. This is the genius of it. So, you know, when it started to work for me, and then I, of course, put a photo on social media on my story. And within an hour, a hundred people, men, women, children around the world were high-fiving and tagging themselves. I thought, okay, whoa. First of all, I'm not the only one who's feeling like uh, the world on my shoulders. Okay, that's reassuring. And secondly, maybe this thing isn't that cheesy after all. And so I've spent the last year researching this. And so first, let me explain in addressing your question about how do you get your mind to stop going down the road of beating the shit out of yourself for all the stuff that you did when you were just trying to survive. Because that's what you were trying to do. You were just trying to survive. And I have been startled, Fern. You know, I was molested when I was uh, in the fourth grade and it was a one-time incident. A, I woke up in the middle of the night at a big family thing with lots of different families and all the kids were in one room and there was an older kid on top of me. And it is that moment that my anxiety began. I literally had a fight or flight response, which is all that anxiety is. Anxiety in your body is just an alarm bell going off when, you're, uh, uh, when your uh, nervous system goes into a sympathetic or an on, age, on edge alarm state. And I possumed, I disassociated, I literally left my body. And that next morning I woke up knowing that something was wrong, knowing that something bad had happened. 
And in, in that moment, my nervous system was still on alarm. And when I walked downstairs that morning, my mom was cooking breakfast. The kids were all over the kitchen, lots of other moms around. And my mom turned to me and said, how'd you sleep, honey? And I froze. And I froze because the kid was sitting at the kitchen table. Now I knew if I said something, my mother, she's a farm gal. She grew up on a cattle farm. She would she would literally take that spatula and hit him into next week. Like there was no concern about my mom. I was concerned about what this person would do. And so my nervous system in that moment got hardwired to be on edge, to be worried about how people react. And I have lived in that state for literally ever since 45 years. And so one of the things that happens, we're going to talk about our nervous system because there's also a high five you can do to your heart that is profound for any kind of anxiety or trauma that you may be feeling. And we're going to explain that in a minute. But first, I want to explain what some of the world's leading uh, neuroscientists have said about why the high five habit works. When you go to raise your hand in the mirror, and this is how you're going to do it. You can do it right after you listen to this. You can do it tomorrow morning. What I want you to do to make it a habit, first of all, is I want you to do it right after you brush your teeth. Hopefully we're all brushing our teeth every day. Uh, it's a really good habit to have. When you put your, uh, your, your, your toothbrush down, like right on the counter, now we're gonna practice the high five. You're gonna take a minute and you're just gonna look at yourself. And I want you to, in that moment, I want you to set an intention. And the reason why I want you to set an intention as you're with yourself is because there is new research out of Harvard that shows that if you take just a minute in the morning and you think about how you're gonna show up today and who you're gonna be, and more importantly, what actually matters to you? What game do you wanna play that you wanna make progress on? Not complete, not win at, just what's one thing you wanna inch forward? And how do you need to show up today? to really engage in that game that matters to you. It could be something personal, could be something at work. It doesn't matter with your kids. And then once you have that in your mind, you're gonna raise your hand and you're going to high five yourself. And yes, it will feel weird. Yes, it will feel awkward, but I'm gonna tell you what's not gonna happen. It is neurologically and scientifically impossible to raise your hand and high five your reflection and think, gosh, you suck, boy, you're ugly. Your chin's really pointy. Your jowls, Mel, are starting to look like saddlebags on a pack mule. Like you can't think those things. You just can't. And here's yeah. why. You have spent your lifetime high-fiving other people or raising your hands in celebration with other people. You've done it so many times that the gesture of high-fiving, even by just seeing other people do it in sports matches, it's already encoded. Like Fern, what is when somebody high-fives you, what are they saying to you? Well, I think they're, they're celebrating you on a subconscious level and saying, I see you. Hey, and I think what I'm realizing as you're talking is and this is so obvious to say, but it's just hit me, is that we're not to underestimate habits, because I think some of the time we're sat there waiting for, quite frankly, an epiphany. There's going to be this moment where I really like myself or if I get the job, the partner, the thing, then I'm going to like myself. We've got to do the habit bit first. Yes. To get anywhere near that. And, yes. and we are all relying on some miraculous, maybe it's because we, we've been sort of indoctrinated over the years with like the big reality TV shows where, you know, all of a sudden you're celebrated and you look amazing and you're on TV and everyone's cheering at you. And I'm going to have that moment. It's going to happen down the line. This is a habit. This is like you say, cleaning your bloody teeth. This is a habit we have to do every day. And it's as much as sort of changing your habit is, can be tiresome. Once you're in a habit, you don't even know you're doing it. I don't think I'm going to brush my teeth. You're just doing it. So we can't underestimate habit here. Yes. And by the way, you already have a habit that we're trying to break, which is you have a habit yes. of ignoring or criticizing yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just like you're cleaning your teeth, we got to clean your mind of all that bullshit you've been saying for a long time. But that's time. empowering because often we believe it. We think, well, I am just a piece of shit, but it's empowering to know, no, that is a habit that I go to, that I think I'm a piece of shit when X, Y, Z happens. It's not true. That also is a habit. Empowering, both things. Yes. Empowering. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And you have friends that have done piece of shit things in their lives. Yeah. And you can understand that they did that. They drank, they were addicted, they cheated on people, they like whatever they did, they were a, 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 a bloody asshole. But you can now see that they're trying. You can now see that they're changing and they're working hard and you can love them through it. 
I'm here to tell you, you have to make a habit of doing this for yourself every day. And you just said this thing about, I'll be happy when I get that job or I lose that weight. The problem with attaching your happiness and your validation and your support to achieving something is once you achieve it, you are stuck with the old habit of still hating yourself. And you're now gonna to need to find something else to achieve in order to prove that you're worthy of it again. You see, I've been an overachiever my whole life because I've equated achieving with being worth something. And when you are an overachiever and you think it's only when you're achieving something that you are worth loving or celebrating, you will be a jealous motherfucker because everybody else that's succeeding is now competing with you for the love and for the worth that you want. And when you start to actually give yourself the love and the self-validation that you need, even when you're failing, especially when moments are hard, when you're you know, telling yourself, okay, Rex was an asshole to me last night and I feel like a terrible mother and you stand there for, and you're like, you know what? Today, today I am, I'm, I'm just gonna show up and I'm gonna be compassionate and patient both with him and with myself. And you raise your hand and you high five yourself. What you're doing in that moment is you're shutting down the criticism. It's an act of defiance to that beatdown that you've been giving yourself. And because this is the coolest part, everybody, because you've been high-fiving everybody else and watching everybody else do it, the, all the messaging, I believe you, I love you, we got this. You know, you give a teammate a high-five or a kid a high-five when their attitude is sinking to basically say, I get it, it's hard, you blew it. But guess what, pick back up, we're going in, come on, we got this, I got your back, you're not alone here. Mm -hmm. So it communicates all of that, it's already in your subconscious. So when you go to raise your hand, Two things happen. First of all, your nervous system recognizes the raised hand as a celebratory action. And so as you start to repeat this habit, it will start to give you a jolt of energy. This research comes from Dr. Daniel Amen, who you know is this world's leading neuroscientist. He also said that the act of high-fiving gives you a drip of dopamine. So if you do this for more than five days and you start to push through the awkwardness and you start to push through how weird it feels because it's a new habit and because you're basically silencing judgment, you're going to feel your mood boost because your brain is releasing dopamine because of the subconscious programming associated with high-fiving. And that's not all. This is really cool. So I know you have a lot of parents that listen and you need to, I know you've already read the study, but if you'll allow me, I want to unpack this because this is mind blowing. So there was a study that they did with kids, right? Where they wanted to know what's the best way to motivate a human being through a really challenging situation. And we're all going through a really challenging situation right now with how overwhelming the world is. And um, they said, we're going to divide kids into three groups. And group number one, we're going to give these kids a very challenging bunch of homework to work through, super hard. And we're going to do that for all three groups. So these poor kids are toiling away at this challenging stuff. And group number one, the encouragement that they gave these kids was based on the growth and the fixed mindset research from Dr. Carol Dweck. And what we know about this is that the fixed growth praise is basically walking up to somebody and complimenting them about something about them. Hey, you're really smart. Hey, you're a good student. Hey, uh, you know, I love the sweater that you're wearing. Keep on going. Yeah, that's sort of motivating because somebody sees you. The next group got the, the growth mindset type of praise, which is basically to tell somebody that they're doing a good job working hard. And what we know based on research is when you reward somebody or praise them for their hard work, you feel empowered because you can control your hard work. So you work a little harder. And sure enough, these kids in this second group, Fern, who were told you're working really hard, keep going. Oh, I love your perseverance. They worked a lot harder than the kids that were told they were smart. But check this out. The third group, the researchers didn't say a word to them. Not a word. These kids simply had a researcher walk up to them and high five them. That's it. Those kids who got a high five outworked, had more confidence, had better results, felt better about themselves than the other two groups combined. Mm. And the answer is why. And the reason is based on psychology. We all have fundamental emotional needs to be seen, to be heard, and to be loved and celebrated for the unique human being that we are. When those needs of being seen, heard, and celebrated are met, you feel affirmed 
you feel confident, you feel whole. When those needs are not being met, you feel rejected, you feel invisible, you feel disconnected and lost. So a simple high five was affirming that those researchers saw, wow, you're working really hard. Wow, I hear you, you're struggling with this. And wow, I'm gonna celebrate you right here in this moment for who you are and how you're showing up and how you're going through. And I'm here to tell you, simply doing this for yourself every single morning and making it a habit and teaching it to your kids, it empowers you in a way that is hard to describe because for the first time in your life, you are giving yourself what you have been seeking from other people. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.